prohibition was a long time coming for something so unnecessary although at the time it wasn't <laughs> seen as it. so unnecessary yeah it's stupid but it was necessary at the time <laughs> if you were an alcoholic in 1916 then the great depression doesn't start in 1929 it starts in 1917 it was a depression but for like booze y your liver was the dust bowl mm -hmm. just to give like a quick history of prohibition the move towards prohibition was spearheaded by three groups the anti-saloon league led by st montgomery the prohibition party the anti-fun league yeah the anti-fun league also known as the women's christian temperance union <laughs> those old biddies <laughs> the wct you again <laughs> the temperance movie which in america went back it to it's nice to wctu <laughs> but the christian the temperance movement which in america went back to the early 1800s on the east coast purposed itself with saving the household and not not that wasn't its sole purpose but that was kind of like one of the more main yeah, keep dad from points. beating uh, little Thank sunny you. it was specifically meant for the women and children by pulling the rug <laughs> for protection for protection by pulling the rug from underneath alcohol specifically the rug from underneath the men <laughs> just literally pulled the rug from underneath <laughs> now stop him yeah most women at the time didn't have like paying jobs they ran households having a job was like male folks thing and a male would get paid and in the spirit of the era would gamble and drink an entire week's worth of pay away in like a single night without providing for his family and the family suffers and as soon as anybody presses in on that he can get because he's drunk would violently probably beat his wife and children so it was this toxic environment all around the country the golden days <laughs> wasn't the past great it's just pc culture <laughs> What, I can't beat my own family anymore? What, I have to <laughs> go beat I his family? Yeah. <laughs> Why did I give birth to my wife <laughs> if I can't beat her? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so yes, alcoholism was seen as a major epidemic, and moderating it, if not completely stopping it, was seen as a necessity. The temperance movement gained momentum in the late 19th century and through the early years of the 20th century, with Christian morals and values as the guiding light. I love those. I know, they taste so good. <laughs> in 1906, the population of Los Angeles was 56% Protestant, and most of them were native-born Midwesterners who'd come over here who truly <laughs> believed in prohibition because in smaller Shit, towns that's not 2016 oh yeah no this is all wrong <laughs> in smaller towns cutting off the alcohol supply is a feasible task mm -hmm. that might actually mm -hmm. work soon enough politicians began supporting prohibition because supporting it meant you were in support of good clean families who were moral and that looks good on your as part of your platform yeah. so there were senators who truly didn't even believe in it would push for it and it all came to a head when the 18th amendment to the constitution was ratified under the informal title the volstead act as you mm -hmm. mentioned in 1917 the volstead act went state by state for ratification passing as a law so now the three-headed beast which is the anti-saloon league the wctu and the prohibition party they started eat away at la the anti-saloon league achieved its first victory in 1899 when they successfully limited the number of saloons in los angeles to 200 oh no only 200 saloons only 200 that's more than there are people in the city at that time <laughs> you have all personalized saloons <laughs> two Go saloons home to saloon. for <laughs> every, every drug. Drug. in 1904 the anti-saloon league launched a campaign to rid the city of them completely. The Gandir Ordinance was put into effect and this functioned... Where are the bandits going to hide out? <laughs> we got to go to caves now? Well, I have my champagne in there so I won't explode. <laughs> Get out of there. Under the Gandir Ordinance, this was put into effect and it functioned against saloons in two ways. It made it illegal to sell liquor containing over 14% of alcohol within it, obviously. And it also limited the hours the saloon could stay open. Initially, when it first started, they were pushed to close at midnight. But under the Gandir Ordinance, named after Daniel Gandir, who was the superintendent uh, of the... Don't know of the superintendent of the anti-saloon league hey what's your position in the anti-saloon league again <laughs> uh inferior intendant <laughs> mm, don't worry I'm asking questions. <laughs> they were initially pushed to close at midnight. After the Gandir ordinance, they had to operate between 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then after that, they were just completely closed. Yeah, that's good enough. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> at some point, I read that under the Gandir ordinance, you can get arrested for selling beer that contained 2.75% alcohol in it. But then that was overturned in 1919 as being crazy pants bananas mm -hmm. or crazy banana pants. One of those <laughs> two. Sorry, I got the notes wrong. <laughs> These are banana crazy pants. <laughs> Excuse me. Its initial purpose at Prohibition was to prohibit the sale of intoxicating liquors, not liquors containing a slight percentage of alcohol which is how near beer works yeah yeah or as uh, medicinal beer so by 1917 the city voted itself to be completely dry two years before the federal amendment took effect los angeles was the largest city in the country at the time totally without legal drinking parlors a saloonless city oh. No beer. My my ailments. What am I going to do about my ailments? What is going to cure what ails me? <laughs> so the prohibition boulder begins rolling in 1970, and then there's like a sort of prohibition probation period in between. <laughs> prohibition probation? The PP? <laughs> you can make me PP? For not drinking any beer, I sure have a lot of PP here. <laughs> Everyone's feeling this whole PP thing. Between 1918 and 1919 was this sort of period where the papers were reporting that the PPP? they. PP? <laughs> <laughs> the papers for the prohibition probation period? <laughs> 
P-U. Did I tell you that all old movies have a lot of Q words in them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like we we're quarreling. It was quite queer. I know all well about your psychotic problems. <laughs> <laughs> the papers at the time were reporting that there was 13,000 less arrests made since the restrictions had been enacted. That's ridiculous. You're right. That's way too many. The headline of this paper I read was called The First Saloonless Year. Many yeah. saloons had to become cafes, like you said, or soft beverage establishments. Others became gospel halls. Others mm-hmm. just shut down completely. Gospel uh, halls. Both saloons, once they shut down, they became like gospel. Oh, halls. it wasn't like a saloon anymore. They're like, yeah. oh, we're going to move a church in here. Like, okay. <laughs> we'll purify the area. <laughs> Papers reported that men of Los Angeles were starting to appreciate their families and homes once again. <laughs> Women and children were happier with that. Property value was increasing. All it took was one year of driveness to drive all the men back to their miserable homes. <laughs> there was a 10 acre inebriate farm on Los Feliz Road in Frogtown that helped men dry out. It afterwards treated women with STDs. They should hook them up with those sopping wet men. <laughs> Poor families were less dependent on the municipality than ever before in the city. San Pedro was no longer a drunken port town like it was before. Now it was a prosperous little city by the bay full of churches and homes and cafes. <laughs> it was now San Francisco. <laughs> no longer will the residents of San Pedro see Catholic priests stumbling out of saloons midday uh, like it was reported. <laughs> Apparently the harbor areas, Long Beach, San Pedro, Venice, and Santa Monica were all troublesome areas because they were port areas. Yeah. So when the initiatives and ordinance were starting to be issued, they wanted the city wanted those areas to be bone dry. No liquor, nothing. Dry up the ocean. <laughs> <None> of- <laughs> and sand. As far as I can see, just sand and dirt. Fish bones. And fish bone, which were just starting at the time. Things were, you know, looking up in that first year. July 1919 was when there was supposed to be a total blackout. See what I did there? Of alcohol across the city <laughs> with no end to prohibition in sight. Keep this in mind. Cross sight. <laughs> oh boy. Keep Don't this in tell mind. tell my mom I made that joke. If there were that many saloons in town before prohibition and they were all shut down, think of how many people were now out of work. Bartenders, servers, grape growers in Northern California, like everybody. Wife beaters. Wife beaters. And, <laughs> and they didn't have anything to drink anymore. Prohibition takes effect. The wife beating industry went way down. I got laid off again. Prohibition takes effect nationally in January of 1920 and all those criminals rubbed their dirty little hands together and said, let the games begin. <laughs> but we already did it three years ago and we're a town built on crooks and weirdos. So mm-hmm. just try to stop us. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want to get too much let into the game. games continue. <laughs> I don't want to get too much into gangsters and mobs in this episode. That's another episode that we plan on doing. So I'm just going to try to keep it as bootleggy as possible. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, the population of LA in 1920 at the beginning of Prohibition was 36,000. By 1930, the population would be 235,000 people. Think about how much that expense in 10 years during Prohibition. As the underline of all this, Hollywood's silent era is in full swing. And by 1927, they have talkies and it becomes an even bigger business. Mm -hmm. That's the underlying thing of all this. First of all, like you were saying, there were legal ways to get alcohol. There was sacramental wine, which was okay as long as it was truly the blood of the Lord. As long, as long as it came straight from his bloody hands. <laughs> Just squeeze as much out of that crucifix as possible. Got any more in you? <laughs> this is del- I mean, I know you're in pain, but this is delicious. Your finest batch, brother. Are you juicing him over there? Yeah, he's still juicing. <laughs> Apparently, also, you can get a prescription pint of whiskey for anything from a toothache to a flu to a terrible case of the sobers. So it's kind of like how marijuana is now. Yeah, basically. It, that was, I, I'm it, sure it wasn't as easy, but... Yeah. On my back. I need whiskey. And you could refill that... I need a Moscow mule. Prescription every 10 days. Whoa. Also, to be clear, Prohibition made it illegal to manufacture, transport, import, export, and sell alcoholic beverages, but it was still legal to consume it in your private residence at your leisure. So you better believe people stocked up and hoarded it before (laughs) it was all enacted. Now to the crimes and city fun stuff. Old smelly Vernon, California, which is south of downtown and outside. Vinci? (laughs) South of downtown and outside of the then city limits became a new hotspot for drinking fun. The Vernon Tigers. The Vernon Tigers, thank you. Not only was baseball popular. Myers Tigers. Myers Tigers. Baseball was very popular in Vernon, so was boxing. Boxing. Boxing promoter Jack Doyle had a saloon aptly titled Jack Doyle Saloon, <laughs> and it boasted about having the longest bar in the world. Oh, oh I remember we talked we about this. We did talk this. about this. Remember, it, remember, it had to contend with Agricultural Park, which also had the I longest bar. I still don't know what that means. It's just a long bar. It doesn't, <laughs> like, like, how when long I, could it be? It's weird because when I read the description, it's 100 feet long. I'm like, okay. But then I said, I read some of the speakeasy, which was supposed to be hidden, had 300 foot long <laughs> bars. So I don't really know. But they, apparently that's what it's known for was we had the longest bar. Imagine like a bar trying to compete with that. I don't get it. Like, like how do you have the room? I went to Agricultural Park last week. That bar isn't even that long. I could beat that. Like, imagine having that much competition in you. (laughs) Give me some plank wood. We have the tallest bar in the world. Like, who (laughs) wants, like, just give me alcohol. We have the most chairs at a bar. (laughs) 
they're just stacked up. You can't sit in them. But we got the most. <laughs> the agricultural park closed 1913, so we didn't even have to contend with it, really. <laughs> At the longest bar, which, like I said, was 100 feet long, apparently, there were 37 bartenders ringing up, That's like, 30 cash registers. Absurd. It's, it's absurd. That sounds like the set of a musical from the, <laughs> from the 30s, not a... <laughs> it's something that is way too long for its own good. Something that is 12 minutes when it should be two minutes. Behind the bar hung a sign that read, if your children need shoes, don't buy any booze, which gives new sadness to the gambling expression, Papa needs a new pair of shoes, <laughs> because it's probably for his children, and the desperation for them is because he can't drink without them. Uh, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> Kid needs shoes, Papa needs shoes, Papa needs beer. <laughs> Papa has got a brand new bag, but he doesn't have any shoes to put in it. Nothing in the bag. He's got, he's got a new bag. <laughs> there were peepholes in the ceiling because Doyle had an upstairs office, and he had to keep an eye on the happenings below. Wait a minute, so he would, like, crawl on the ground looking I bet he like <laughs> peek over oh I was thinking it's like a people like in a door and he's that's, like, what's going on that's kind of weird because if it's big enough for you to look through just casually you could step in it and fall through the <laughs> very careful man the saloon was attached to a boxing arena which was also owned by Doyle apparently and boxing and baseball were popular in Vernon they had the Pacific Coast League the Vernon Tigers Doyle Saloon made it as far as 1919 before it was kaput on the last night it was open 60 bartenders served a thousand sad customers for Doyle's <laughs> last call is this that why you were saying that it reminds you of True Detective season 2 there's another thing but oh, yeah okay yeah that's well, the also, tunnels yeah the two things together but, but yeah like a guy running a boxing thing in yeah. burden and having his eye on the bar and uh, also this is just as cohesive as true detective sh- Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah vernon also had the vernon country club where one can go and buy dance and party with whatever stars they were willing to go with vernon chaplin and arbuckle fatty, Chap- fatty arbuckle and charlie chaplin were known to frequent doyle's saloon really but of course they were not mary pickford but truly i came across so she many there <laughs> I came across so many weird, interesting things about Vernon that I want to dedicate a whole episode to Vernon and Maywood because there's like it's big on sports and vice and local corruption that is like pretty recent. Yeah, Whatever. it's a strange place. Yeah, so it comes down to the Crooked Boys. I try to keep this set, like I said as bootleg as possible. Now the men who built this town and drew people in, such as LA Times publisher Harry Chandler, who's partly responsible for the Hollywood sign, had supplied local politicians with advertising, publicity, and the money needed to sell properties and get people moved in and grow all the businesses and put people in political seats. This created a very uncomfortably close relationship between business owners who did not have moral fortitude and politicians who most likely had no moral fortitude. After hey now, Greg, this is in real time with Bill Maher. <laughs> what is this, The Daily Show? Don't you remember our kid gloves? <laughs> you put those back on. Your knuckles are showing. Hey, you meant that. <laughs> hey, ouch. <laughs> ouch. After the exchange for services, the business barons of the city now had the city government tucked in their pocket. The problem with all this is that the criminal element of the gangster variety also moved westward or south, whatever, and now had hopes of securing local politicians to use and abuse. The only folk who could stop them were the Los Angeles Police Department, who could be paid to work for any crooked bastard that they <laughs> paid the highest. So if we're talking crooked cops, we gotta talk about Guy McAfee, the captain, as they called oh him. Boy. He was a captain of the LA Vice Squad, or as they're known, the Purity Squad. How adorable. He was discharged from the LAPD in 1970, right when the prohibition took effect, for running a craps game in the assembly room of the police headquarters. Then he got his badge reinstated and was assigned to the Purity Squad. <laughs> Part of the McAfee's job was to get acquainted with the underbelly of Los Angeles, get to know the owners and the proprietors and nut clubs and brothels and gambling rings. And he said, you know, this seems pretty neat. Maybe I should get me one of these saloons and brothels. He even ended up, I don't know if he married the madam of a brothel or he turned his wife Marie into a madam. Oh, but that. boy. Either way. Like, Either way, I'm going. Another man's wife. So apparently like before a big raid on a speakeasy, other LAP officers would often notice the captain whistling into the phone. And when the cops got there, all the damning evidence had disappeared. Wow. How very odd. He eventually left the LAPD because they didn't pay enough. <laughs> Rampart 1.0. He slipped quite easily into a crime boss status along the likes of the combination, Albert Marco and Charlie the Wolf Crawford, who we'll get into. Anyways, McAfee opened up a speakeasy and casino on the Sunset Ship called the Clover Club, where liquor was served, quote, discreetly, even though it probably didn't need to be. Keep in mind that later- a mustache on. Keep in mind that later in life, McAfee pretty much influenced and directly had a heavy hand in the creation of the Las Vegas Strip. Really? That's how, yeah, th- that's how crooked this guy was. That's so weird. Now, this isn't a gangster episode, like I was saying, but reading in is- my... It's only gangsta. Yeah, so my reading is limited, but from what I could tell, before there was Cohen, there was Crawford, the wolf, the gray wolf of Spring Street, or Good Time Charlie. I'll keep it brief and pertinent. Charles Crawford was this mobster out of Seattle who fled Washington for pretty much everything he comes to do in Los Angeles. Once in LA, he opened up the Maple Bar. Yes, like the donut. Mm. Please stop it, Greg. I'm hungry. On Fifth and Maple, outside of downtown LA. Very ritzy, very luxurious bar, a casino, and very humble bordello. Mm, was there cream inside? <laughs> <laughs> you better believe. <laughs> Dripping. Their clientele included politicians, judges, and public officials of the like. Of Having this establishment meant that he became familiar with the right local powerful people who could keep his crime stuff on the right side of the law. Soon enough, Crawford is running a group known as the City Hall Gang, <laughs> a well-known crime syndicate, mostly made up of local politicians and public officials that he had in his pocket. One of his top aides was a former USC star and 
law school graduate turned political fixer Kent Kane Parrott, and together they were able to secure the mayor's seat for one of their pals, George Cryer, in 1921, as a mayor of Los Angeles. Hmm. Sort of. On paper, he was, but all the decisions were pretty much going down to the puppeteers, Crawford, hmm. and mostly Parrott. Parrott was basically a de facto oh, mayor. interesting that the Parrott was the actual master. Think about it! <laughs> it's a think piece. We're submitting this to the New Yorker brewery. Par- Parrott pretty much was in a position to operate the Harbor Commission and the LAPD, and this was for all of the 20s. So basically, crime was legal when Crawford needed to be. <laughs> Parrot was another one of these guys who may need his own episode because he's like a Dashiell Hammett character. He like He's playing all yeah. sides using intelligence. Ray Chandler. Ray Chandler. No, Dash- um, both, really. <laughs> he's just a really smart, charming guy who even like, he forced Harry Chandler, who pretty much was a powerful man in the city, into a truce over the municipal ownership of the electrical utility against the LA Times. In the same vein, Raymond Chandler had admitted to using the model of Charles Crawford as the villain for so many of his... Yeah, yeah. it sounds like it. Yeah, but that's besides the point anyways. So basically, bootlegging was run out <laughs> of this... Ignore that, shut up, ignore <laughs> that. Bootlegging was basically run out of City Hall. Crawford even boasted about having a private telephone line in City Hall. That's how easy it was. Basically, Crawford and Parrot are running all of the 20s. Crawford is in charge of so much bootlegging. Two things happen after he died. We won't get too much into it just because it's a gangster episode. One, he gets buried at Forest Long Glendale, not far from Edward Everett Horton, the narrator of Fractured Fairy Tales from Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> he also the owner of the ranch in Encino where F. Scott Fitzgerald lived briefly. Really? F. Scott Fitzgerald, known Nothing. drunk of the Roaring Twenties. <laughs> the other thing that happened after Crawford died was his widow opened up the Crosswords of the World, which is the shopping area yeah. off of Sunset Near that's, shaped like, yeah, that's shaped like a, like a cruise ship. It is one of the country's first shopping malls. That's where her husband died. More on that on another episode. So lawlessness under the guise of being lawful, that was 20s Los Angeles. Apparently, during a 15-month period, more than 100 of the 1,200 police officers were charged for misconduct or dismissed from duty. Between 1919 and 1923, eight police chiefs came and went, overwhelmed by the Chinatown-esque monolith of corruption that mm-hmm. they faced. In 1924, voters elected Asia Keys, who was a dry, to be the city district attorney. He proved to be, of course, lenient on all bootleggers. They said all dealings with bootleggers were done out in the open because no one was there to stop them. LAPD worked for them, the politicians worked for them, so they didn't need to hide anything. They mm. kind of like, they probably had to wait till night, but that's <laughs> it. But that's the pros and the big shots. There still was the little guys trying to score big. There were reportedly 400 speakeasies in the Los Angeles area and twice as much moonshine stills in the surrounding areas. <laughs> moonshine stills were the meth labs of their day and they only sound romantic because Annie Griffith show made them yeah. funny. <laughs> was, Smash it up. <laughs> since real alcohol and liquor was scarce, backyard moonshiners were using dangerous chemicals to brew with and they were not experts. Mm-hmm. There was an increase in alcohol poisoning and regular poisoning poisonings and a lot of people died. <laughs> there were supposedly several stills in areas like Newhall and Downey where they made something called Grapo Moonshine that burned all the way down and kept burning. <laughs> in Chino, outside of the city limits, so sorry, I know you hate that, but there was a raid. I don't hear it. No, there listen, was, I'm not listening. I'm, I'm going to take my headphones off. There was a raid of 20,000 gallons of whiskey and corn mash in three 250-gallon copper steels. I bet we could have done more. Come on, yeah, give us a bigger... Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll do it in less copper steels. We'll okay. do it in silver. Huge amounts of alcohol was being smuggled in from either Canada as way of Santa Barbara or most ports, really, or Tijuana. Tijuana, Mexico, people just drive it up. Uh, Tijuana, Mexico. These little guys could be busted and jailed if they weren't paying for police protection, and it seems like many of them weren't. There were many pictures of police dumping liquors into the, just straight into the sewers <laughs> To what we can only assume were more copper stills to collect food <laughs> from City Hall. Like that's just drunk fish in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the speakeasies I found about. Some of them were obviously shut down. Others survived this. Bernie's Delicatessen at 1551 Vine Street near Sunset was quite quaint, quarreling <laughs> little uh, dally that sold beer to almost anyone, including undercover cops, which is why it was busted. <laughs> the Italian Cafe and Western sold spaghetti, ravioli, and muscatel, which is sort of wine. Uh-huh. Busted. Uh-huh. No more Italian cafe. <laughs> busted. Give us your raviolis. <laughs> Tony's Cafe on East First Street was also another busted speakeasy. There were several road houses, quote, in Culver City that operated as speakeasies tonight. The most famous being the Cotton Club on West Washington and National. The West Side, I don't know why Culver City and obviously Venice too, were both, every, it was just kind of nobody cared after a certain point. Very lenient on booze yeah. over there. Like you mentioned before, the Townhouse is a bar that still stands on Windward Avenue in Venice. It's very yeah. ornate. It's very beautiful. I've been there a couple times. It also has, particularly when you go there now, hard to catch staircase going downstairs to the Del Monte speakeasy. When Prohibition hit, the owner, an Italian immigrant named Caesar Monetti, is it? Uh, yeah, it yeah, Monotti. Mon- Monotti, yeah, Mon- yeah. We'll call him Monotti. He pretty much said, like, oh, fooey, whatever. Prohibition. I'm serving drinks anyway. Italian for Bah Humbug. <laughs> Since there was a pier nearby, ships would come from Canada there and just stock up his yeah. supply room. It's crazy. His upstairs, he turned into a grocery store during Prohibition, and the basement could be accessed through a trap door lowered on a rope operated dumbwaiter <laughs> for two alcoholics at a time. Or as they're called, dumbwaiters. <laughs> a dumbwaiter of drunks. <laughs> it's a unit of measurement of drunks. <laughs> they now have an awesome burlesque show on Wednesday nights if you ever want to go. I always <laughs> want to get Daniel to go. He won't go because he thinks it's stripping. 
Totally different. <laughs> Arvel's Blues Club in, in Santa Monica. Ladies showing skin. <laughs> ladies showing skin. My, what would my mother think? <laughs> Arvel's Blues Club, like you mentioned, in Santa Monica, also served liquor pretty discreetly. It was a music venue mostly, but they also managed to <laughs> inject this. If you're driving on the 101 near Vermont or the Silver Lake exit, by that Five Points, Third Street, Virgil, Beverly, and Silver Lake, and you see a giant Gothic sort of Art Deco public storage building known, yeah. known as the American Company Storage Building. I love that place. But it's now owned by Public Storage. Dracula's Public Storage yeah, Building. Yeah, it's where he keeps all his uh, coffins. The top floor used to be a speakeasy, the 41 Club. They got raided. Really? Yeah, which they got raided, which means they weren't, they must have been behind on security payments. <laughs> but yeah, the top floor was a speakeasy. How they, bold. When they got raided, the cops uncovered different liquors in the value of $10,000. Oh my God, I that's know. like $11,000 in today's money. That's almost like four drinks nowadays. <laughs> right, am I right? Am I right? Come on. Traffic, uh, <laughs> Tinder, dating. Smog. <laughs> What's with the air here? Am I dying? Yes, I hope so soon. The Golden Gopher, in downtown on 8th Street used to sell near beer or medicinal beer to patrons during Prohibition. As recently as 2011, I believe, upon restoring the annex to the Roslyn Hotel in downtown, they found a speakeasy in the basement called the Monterey Room that seemed very luxurious. It had a reception area, a hat check room, a long wooden cabinet to hold booze, a long wooden bar. There's a hand-painted flamenco dancer on the door. It had, it had a door. <laughs> wow. Now, now it just holds supplies. Or does it? Mm, what's in there? Knock three times, password is periwinkle. <laughs> kidding don't do that you'll get shot Roslyn also possibly haunted by ghosts Roslyn also linked to the Cecil in that the killer of the pigeon lady might have also killed a woman at the Roslyn Hotel and the Cecil Hotel was one of the first places to house AA meetings yeah. which was needed during Prohibition yeah. that's the weird link between the two if you want to know more about the Cecil listen to our third oh yeah I guess I Hanukkah. said before it was the, th- the lizard people was the third one it was the second one the yeah, third one the is the third Cecil third one is the Cecil yeah, yeah. yeah. you hear that yeah it's a computer. If you hear a uh, plane landing, it's my brother's computer. Please donate money. We have known <laughs> IML functioning. <laughs> the most famous of the downtown speakeasies that we know about is still open yeah. on Los Angeles and 5th Street, known as the King Andy Saloon, named thus because it is part of the King Edward Hotel. Uh-huh. Both right off... I never put that together. Me neither until I read it. I was like, oh yeah. Duh. Who's uh, Eddie? <laughs> is Eddie here? <laughs> I want to crown him, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Both right off... Eddie Munster. Is that the Eddie? Why is the King... Eddie Saloon famous, Daniel? Well, we mentioned in our episode, a podcast that time forgot, King Eddie Saloon, which was opened kind of late in the game of Prohibition, but they didn't know it was going to end, had a direct link to the underground tunnels of Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. where booze was being run through all the time. (laughs) Not so much by the big wigs of bootlegging, they didn't need to, but the little guys were just using the tunnels for everything. Just bootleggers running past escaped criminals. What do you got? (laughs) (laughs) Running past police trying to get to another pound, running past lizard people, just a weird Times Square down there. The Rosalind hooked up to the tunnels as well, but the King Eddie was a big spot because they like led right up to like the door. Yeah. It was not like there was no weird segues. The saloon part kept quiet as a ruse for piano tuning and a piano store, which supposedly happened a floor above, but the booze was being delivered and served below. As a piano and repair place, no one would question that music was being played. Although some people were like, well, that's kind of weird. It's so late. Well, the Moonlight Sonata, be quiet. <laughs> as previously mentioned, there's 11 miles of marble lined tunnels underneath Los Angeles where the hyper intelligent lizard people dwell <laughs> that was used for all sorts of hyper intelligence. <laughs> they were. I, I re listened to it. Used for all sorts of exchanges legal and illegal. Police have moved high exposure prisoners such as Charles Manson through the tunnels. Bank securities make large sum cast transfers there. They did anyways. Coroners store bodies there. Politicians hid bodies there. Although it was officially cut off from the public, there's a the lover's neck. They neck there because it's so romantic being submerged with the rats. It's like we're in a toilet. <laughs> Kiss me. It is uh, officially cut off to the public but there are secret ways but I didn't write it down. You look it up. That's all the fun. We mentioned it in the yeah. in that episode. I'm not going to mention it again. No. Let's, let's make it some ne- fun. Do we have to repeat ourselves? We don't remember. They were used in episodes of True Detective season two, which were they? Yeah, when he has to go underground and meet the, oh, the bird yeah. people. I call I keep calling them bird people because I want there to be more bird people. <laughs> Before not. he gets spoiler alerted. Another booze option, if speakeasy wasn't your thing, was gambling ships, mm-hmm. which started to spring up in That's 1928, which operated three miles off the coast into international waters. If you've read Raymond Chandler's Farewell, My Lovely, you're familiar mm-hmm. with the idea of what these yeah. do. They could be seen offshores of Santa Monica and Long Beach, and they kind of, from a lot of people, because they had like weird marquee lights and they were celebratory, they, everyone thought they looked like Christmas lights for some reason. I'm like, oh, Christmas is on its way here. <laughs> Christmas is out at sea. But uh, on these ships, you could gamble and booze it up and then get taxied back to shore. The most famous of these ships was the SS Rex, and its captain was the king of the SoCal Rum Runners, an Italian immigrant named Tony Carnero. The Rex and the Battle of Santa Monica Bay happens later in the 30s after Prohibition ends. I won't get too much into it, but Carnero gets his start during the late 20s as a mover of liquor. Carnero owned his own fleet of ships, check that out, and would send them to Canada to get good stuff and then bring back here. Canada. This is just syrup. 
This is hockey stick <laughs> butter. <laughs> At first, he was bringing it onto shore and selling it to wealthy bootleggers and alcoholics, but then he got busted and served time. So when he came back, he started doing gambling ship stuff. <laughs> At least he learned his lesson. Oh, also, by 1929, the mayor, George Cryer, that Parrott and Crawford put in the seat, he was out of office. So the new mm. mayor between 1929 and 1933 was a guy named John C. Porter. He was backed by the Prohibition Party. And he mm. gained approval when, as a member of the U.S. trade delegation to France, refused a wine toast in a public <laughs> ceremony in France. What a swell guy, right? <laughs> oh, here's the thing that I've been wanting to mention in this show somehow. Mayor John C. Porter, former member of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> hey, you voted for him. I was not born. Prove it. Let me see your birth certificate. So this entire time... Your skin looks really crumbly. <laughs> you look very ashy. What's with that? You look gray-faced. Are you a hater of uh, minorities? This entire, <laughs> <From the past. laughs> this entire time, all through the 20s, from 1917 to 1933, the effectiveness of the noble social national experiment was being debated. It was obvious that in big cities, crime was way too F-worded up, and it was unstoppable. Like, it seemed clear that if the ban on sale and manufacturing alcohol was legalized again, the crime surrounding all of it would dissipate. But the problem was that prohibition was effective in smaller, more rural areas. Areas without secret underground tunnels could do this. Everyone was still in favor of social reform, but it seemed like there was another way to go about mm -hmm. it. It was obvious, especially in Los Angeles, that authority figures did not respect the rules of prohibition. Speakeasies were unstoppable. The illegality of manufacturing of alcohol made moonshines flourish and they were killing people. And even President Harding, as a senator, had stocked up on liquor before prohibition and was known to drink. So the lines between legal and illegal were all blurred. They were killing people? Well, they the were... Moonshine? Oh, people dying. From drinking, but there, I've also read articles poison. about yeah people coming upon moonshine and then moonshiners had to kill them. Not a lot, but I read like one or two articles. I wrote a few fan fiction articles <laughs> about prohibition. I wrote one kind of unlawful, uh, starring Tom Hardy and <laughs> Shia LaBeouf. Is that the name of the movie? Whatever. There were several national <laughs> surveys printed in popular publications that asked readers to vote on whether they still believed in prohibition, and they've now voted against it, citing mm. that official corruption was making this ineffective. Mm. So they vote to stop corruption, but nah, <laughs> seriously. How about let's now ban corruption? Let's all be nice have we tried like not being corrupt <laughs> 22nd amendment be nice also after like 10 years the idea of the drunkard was a symbol for rebellion and that was getting attention mm -hmm. and the likes of drunk ass non magoo like wc field was <laughs> gaining popularity at the end of prohibition mm -hmm. that secured this national moment of like let's just get drunk again it's cool to be drunk again. yeah the drunk in the new society still spent his paycheck on booze and gambling and kicked toddlers but now it was funny <laughs> Now it's funny because his nose is big. <laughs> you like a nose that big full of nickels. <laughs> I love W.C. Fields. Uh, uh, you know he. You know that he influenced <laughs> yeah. Doug, Doug McGill. Uh, we're all aware, right? We I mean, have, all... I don't know if we've told enough people yet. <laughs> so starting in the 30s, states were reversing their stance on the 18th Amendment by ratifying the 21st Amendment that would undo the 18th Amendment, like Microsoft Word has. <laughs> It was the Windows 10 to the Windows 8. <laughs> the Democratic platform of 3233 pushed for the repeal of prohibition, promising honest Americans that they could get blotto again in public. <laughs> in public. Los Angeles voters, along with the winning amount of other voters across the country, voted to repeal prohibition. And let me tell you, it worked. 1933. What a waste of an amendment. Like how many, there's so few amendments yeah. have been passed and two of them canceled each other Isn't after that, this. Like, imagine going to 18, like, okay, I'll keep reading. <laughs> Okay, I wasted my time reading that 18th one. The adoption of the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment. Repeal Day is now celebrated on December 5th. What? Celebration Day is different than Repeal Day. Okay, yeah, I remember this confusion yeah. of like, hey, come to our place and drink beer today, but also that day too. And I'm not following yeah, for I mean, that. Yeah, come on. Oh man, okay. What happened to our crazy cast of characters? They're all shot. So all I mean... <laughs> 